Watcha. You're listening to the Disability Program Specialized Services Podcast. I did go to the image Dana Lawler, guest Sophia and Sharer. That's why I got a disability program specialized services. I got a disability program specialized in general, I disabilities. I don't know. Um, when I got a disability program, I explained it. I didn't got the word. I don't know. I didn't know. I didn't know. Disability. I don't know. Good. So I got a disability program with Dana and Sophia. I think I said. Please note that in this episode, the presenters offer answers to questions from the public from a disability's point of view. They are not experts in the field of mental health or addictions and do not intend to provide specific recommendations on how to intervene in such situations. Welcome. What's ya? Hello. My name is Dana Lawler and I'm a speech language pathologist by training and a clinical advisor on the Disability Program's Specialized Services team. What ya? Yeah. My name is Sophia Scherer, and I am an occupational therapist by training and a clinical advisor on the Disability Program Specialized Services team. Hello, Sophia, and it's good to be back with you again. It's good to be with you, Dana. <laughs> so let's just orient everybody here, all of our listeners. Thank you for listening in. Sofiane and I are back with you after our training week in March, where we talked about general disabilities, disabilities in general, and what, uh, what disabilities mean. We had some online info sessions for you during that week, um, and we talked about disabilities in a very broad way. And in the last 30 minutes of our session together... We received some wonderful questions from you, and we did our best at the time to answer those questions, but you can imagine that getting live questions like that, it's hard to kind of answer in a way that you feel really good about. So here we are again today to circle back on on some really important questions that you brought to us, and, and we wanted to take the time to dig in a bit more. So this is why we're here and recording this conversation today. Uh, we're hoping that by listening in or watching, uh, you'll be able to, you know, have some more information related to disabilities. And if you're not sure how to explain disabilities to someone else, please send them to our webpage. That is disabilityprogramsspecializedservices.org to listen in to the episode called Introduction to Disabilities and to this conversation. Um, so if you haven't listened to the first one, please go back and listen in. You can find the link in the show notes. And here we are again to dig in, Sofiane and I. So Sofiane, uh, let's, let's talk. You ready? Yes. All right. Yeah, I am. I'm going to throw you the first question. One of the questions that we dug into, and I think it's worth explaining again and digging into, is what is a disability? Yeah, it is a complex concept. There is multiple definitions, as we mentioned uh, in our podcast. And I think it's good to uh, circle mm-hmm. back and, and re-explain. And even for us, mm-hmm. uh, the more we dig in, the more we get a full explanation yeah. on it that we can give. So the explanation that we're using in the team uh, is based, is inspired by the social model of disabilities. So as I mentioned, there's different views, but I feel like this view helps us see a little bit more how we can help people by adapting the environment, uh, how it's not just the person mm-hmm. who has a disability, it's it's how everything gets together mm-hmm. to create a disability. So in order to understand disability from that point of view, we need to look at two other words, uh, two concepts, the concept of environment and the person. And uh, so you'll see an image here. We have an image just to illustrate a disability. Uh, So you see you have the word environment there. The environment is everything that surrounds us. So it's it's the land, it's the animals, it's the built environment and the buildings around us, how the streets are made. And it's also the people around us. 
Uh, we interact with our family, our neighbors, our co-workers. So how are they interacting with us? Are they judging us for challenges that we are or are they helping us with our challenges? Are they uh, seeing and recognizing ourselves for uh, our strengths? Also, that, that helps someone flourish. Mm -hmm. uh, so, and are they helping enough? Too much, we can help someone too much and stop them from developing their skills if we help too much. Uh, or are they helping us not enough? So this is this is part of the environment. The rules, the laws, mm. the services that we have access to also are part of our environment. Mm -hmm. And then you have the person. So everyone, no matter who we are, we all have challenges and we have skills and strengths. And we are all different. We all have different things to bring to the table. So let's say, so when there is a mismatch between the environment and the person, that's when we have a disability. So we might have challenges. If the environment is creating even more barriers with those challenges, then it will make it more difficult for us to go through our day, through our life. When the environment helps us with our challenges, maybe we won't have a disability, but we'll still have challenges as everyone has. And some people have more bigger challenges than others. So let's take an example. As a person, we can have challenges in our body, our mind, our spirit. I can give an example from myself. I have a challenge distinguishing my right from my left. I've worked on it. I've practiced Oh, as a kid, as an adult, I've always tried and it takes me time. I need to stop mm. Mm. and think to figure it out. It's not natural. It's not instinctive. I need time. I do it, but I need a bit more time than other people. Um, it's not that much of a challenge in my life, except for when I drive mm -hmm. and I don't know where I'm going. Mm. And I have someone on the passenger seat giving me directions. Mm. So if that person tells me last minute, turn right, chances are I won't turn right. right. You know, there's 50% chances that I'll turn left. Right. So, so if that person is aware of that and they want to help me out, then they can, they, they can take time to tell me ahead of time. Mm. You know, they can tell me a bit more longer in advance so I can think, figure it out and then turn. Or they can point the re direction they want me to turn. And then I can do it in a much better way, mm -hmm. in a much easier way. If the person in the passenger seat thinks, oh my gosh, she can't distinguish her right from her left. Come on. Like that can be possible. I'll still like, I'll, I'll tell her last minute. She'll figure it out. It's not true. I'm sure she can do it. I'll feel a lot of pressure because I will feel the judgment from that person. Mm -hmm. I'll get nervous and I'll be worse at figuring it out. So we have more chances of getting lost. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's the environment around me right. that can help me. You no, know, if the person tells me ahead of time or points, I won't have a disability, minor, mm -hmm. very small disability, but I won't have that challenge, that, that disability. Mm -hmm. I still have the same challenge inside of me figuring it out. Mm -hmm. If the person has, is judging me and it's, is impatient and tells me last minute, well, uh, I will have trouble going through that task well. So that could be a minor disability. Mm. It can be a person or it can be a GPS. I can use mm -hmm. a GPS for that. And the GPS might be programmed to tell me ahead of time or not. And it will be more or less difficult. Mm -hmm. When we look at this image, we have a guy in a wheelchair so he seems to have difficulties with his legs, moving his legs, but I'm pretty sure he has great skills at driving his wheelchair. He's probably practiced a lot and he's got strong arms, as we can see. I'm sure he can move his wheelchair around and has an easier, easy time moving and manipulating that. And that needs practice. If this guy goes around his community and wants to visit his friends and gets in front of a set of stairs. So his friend's house has stairs in front. He's stuck. He cannot go and visit his friend. Mm. So then there is a disability. 
So he has a challenge in his body with his legs. If there are stairs in front of him, he cannot do what's important for him. Mm -hmm. He has a disability. Can you imagine if it's his house who has those stairs? Then it's even more disabling. Mm -hmm. He might not be able to get out of his house. Mm -hmm. That's that's very, very disabling. Mm -hmm. If his house or his friend's house is at ground level and a door, there's no doorstep, he can go in and out, no problem. He will still have the same challenge with his legs. He'll be able to do that task. He'll, he won't have a disability going around his community. Mm -hmm. So we can see how the environment can really help us or stop us mm -hmm. from doing what's important to us. And sometimes, yes, we can build our skills. We can work on matching our environment better. Mm -hmm. But sometimes it's not possible. And sometimes it takes a lot of effort to match an environment and we'll still have trouble. So having our environment being adapted to us. Yeah, and match us. And us working. Match us. Yeah, and match yeah. us. Makes it so much easier for a lot of people. And, you know, we're all different, as I mentioned. Mm -hmm. So there's a mold in this environment that... No, we'll ha all have trouble at some mm -hmm. point fitting. And when we think about our environment and we're trying to help it match people in our community, we can help a lot of different people at the same time. Mm -hmm. And by doing that, people don't feel singled out mm -hmm. because you're adapting the environment to a lot of different people. Mm -hmm. It's not, you're, you're not necessarily taking one person and trying to make them fit. Mm -hmm. So... No, there's both that we need to do. That guy in the wheelchair, he learned to use his wheelchair and he needed to learn that skill, but he won't be able, if he's paralyzed, chances are he won't be able to learn to use his legs. That's not something he can do. Right. So he needs the environment to match him. Right. I, I really, I so, really appreciate, yeah. I really appreciate that idea of the mismatch, right? We're talking about the mismatch between the person and then the environment and the social model doesn't put the fault on the person, right? It's, there's no fault in it. And, and so it feels much more in inclusive and much more understanding than I think some other models yes. where it's about what does the person need and how can the environment be matched to that person? And to me, that just, it sits better with me, I think, than some mm -hmm. of the other models that I've, you know, learned about. Yeah. And again, there's no, there's multiple definitions because also sometimes it's not just, it's just not possible to match the environment mm -hmm. or there's, there's both that we need to do right. so we can <clears throat> use different concepts, but it should be fluid huh? and we, right. and the environment can be moved towards a person. The other thing is that adapting the environment won't help, as I mentioned, just one person. And it will not just help people that you see in your community that have visible disabilities, let's say, or that, that have diagnoses. Let's take a very concrete example. If you adapt a house and people in wheelchairs can go in and out and can go around that house and and take a bath and cook for themselves and, and things are adapted for them, that house will also be adapted to most people, mm. tall, small people, smaller people. You will have elders who might start having difficulty, mm. uh, more difficulty walking around. It will help them if they have grab bars in their, their shower, for example. If you have parents using strollers, mm. It's going to be more difficult getting through stairs than if it's at the ground level, no? Mm -hmm. uh, or if you have an access ramp, it's going to be easier for strollers as well. Mm -hmm. um, and it could be temporary yeah. too, eh, Sofiane? Like somebody after yes. a surgery or, right, somebody who needs assistance with their walking, so they're using a walker or a cane temporarily while they're rehabilitating after a surgery or something. Yeah. Totally. Someone who sprained an ankle. Right. That happens frequently. A woman who is pregnant might need a bit more stability, mm. might need to hold on to things a bit more. 
So there's a lot of different reasons why an adapted house will be helpful to mm -hmm. a lot of people. It can also be helpful to people moving furniture. Right. right. If you have wider doors. Right. And no stairs. Right. So it just helps everyone. Yeah. You make some very good points. Thanks. Thanks for coming back on that. I know it is a complex concept, but I think it's really worth the time for us to to dissect it like we did. So thank you. That's great. I want to say the next question I feel, you know, is not our area of training. It's not our field of expertise, but I, you know, we've both agreed that it was a really good question and a question that warranted us, you know, talking a little bit more about. And it's the question of, is drug or alcohol addiction a disability? What would you have to say about thanks that? For, uh, thanks for saying that it's not within our field because it's important to mention it. We're using it. Someone brought that very interesting question to us and we want to make sure we answer it. The goal, we are not specialists of addictions. The goal is not to fully analyze mm -hmm. how addictions are created and how to treat them. It's not our goal. It's just to look at addiction from a disability perception mm -hmm. perspective sorry and it's very complex so we're not we're not trying to to fully analyze this so a person with addiction has challenges with that specific situation uh, they also have skills that help them go through their days uh, there's an, an environment around them now they they have relationships that might be very supportive and help them avoid consuming, or there might be a relationship that drive them towards consuming. You know, if, if their friends are all going to the bar and, mm -hmm. and asking them to go and influencing that person to go, it might be more difficult not to, to use drugs or alcohol. If there is support available in the community for people with addiction, what support is available? Does that person feel comfortable with that support? But is there a living situation? Is there is it a healthy living situation or is it a very challenging and distressing living situation? Mm -hmm. um, also, the the activities that they have access to are they meaningful to them? Are they do they make it worth? putting their energy in, in activities if the person is is a hunter and, and really values hunting, are they able to go hunt, uh, for example? Is it that's meaningful for them? Can they do it or are they are they stopped from doing it? You know, that the, these are all things that can support the person or that can make life more difficult mm -hmm. and create more challenges with addictions and with that in mind with the, the person with their ex addictions do their addictions stop them from doing what's important to them in their life mm -hmm. so again does it stop them from going hunting does it stop them from working from taking care of their family or are they able to do everything that's important to them there are people with addiction who haven't used drugs or alcohol for 30 years and who are mentioning that they still know that the addiction is there mm. if they start using they will get back into it so they feel like they have that challenges inside themselves mm. and they're working to avoid it so let's say they're not using they still have that addiction but they're not using and they have a meaningful life and they do what's important to them still, then they wouldn't, they would not have a disability. But if their consumption is stopping them from going to work, taking care of family or anything else that's important for them, then yes, I would say that this is a disability. Hmm. Does it make sense? To, yeah, it to makes sense. I just... So let me see if I've got this right, Sophia, and I wanted to just think, if an addiction is impeding someone from living their full life, from doing the things that they want to do, and the environment is not there to help them, the combination of those things, then we could say is a disability. 
Yeah, that's exactly it. Okay. Okay. So along the same lines, then the, the other question that had, one of the other questions that came up for us was, is anxiety a disability? So I kind of know, I, I think I kind of know if we're going to follow that same kind of path, I kind of know what you're going to say, but I still want you to, if you can answer that one, is anxiety a, a disability? So again, same disclaimer, we are not specializing right. in mental health. And the goal of this explanation is not to fully analyze anxiety. Right. Um, and yes, it's the same thing. You have someone with a challenge who's like the challenge is anxiety, uh, but you have someone who have a lot of other skills and strengths and you have someone who's living in an environment who's surrounded by people, by different services. So if the person is able to go through their life and do what's important to them, despite anxiety or with mm -hmm. the anxiety, then mm -hmm. they will not have a disability. Mm -hmm. They will, the anxiety might still be present, but if, if they learn skill to manage it, and if the environment, people around them help them manage it, there's tolerance, their, their, their support, and they feel good about, you know, going through their day still, then they might not have a disability. If the anxiety is so, uh, is taking over their life, if, if it's stopping them from going out of their house, if, mm -hmm. if it stops them from doing activities that are important, mm -hmm. then, then we can say that this is a disability. Mm. Okay. Thank you. Uh, that, that sets the stage that, that gives us that kind of framework again, which I think helps to understand what we're talking about when we say disability. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It helps to take different examples and go yeah. around it. Yeah. Dina, we had another question that mm -hmm. I think is, uh, is more for you. When a therapist, a family member or a friend sees that a child has challenges. Let's take an example of delayed speech. So a child mm. that would not speak as much as other children the same age. And the parents are saying, no, no, everything is fine. Everything is going, everything is all right. So if you see that you definitely, you think there is a problem when you observe, uh, what do you do with this? Hmm. That is a, I really value that question because, um, I've had to face that situation many times and I think a lot of therapists do. And I think my answer is, a you know, earlier on in my career and my answer now might be a little bit different, but it's still a journey for me. It's still, it still requires me to be very attentive and conscious of, of what's going on as much as possible. So it's not always easy. It's not easy to talk to parents about concerns that we have or, or things that we're, yeah, that we might be a little bit worried about. It's not easy to bring up those, those topics. It's not easy to have those conversations, but I think they're important conversations to have. And I think it's about finding the right time. And I think it's about developing trust. So what I've found helpful, you know, so far in my own experiences is that I, you know, to sit and take the time to really, to talk with parents, with caregivers and to really listen. And it's hard. It's really hard to do that. But I, I, I will ask, you know, parents, what, what are your priorities for your loved ones, for your loved one? And what is the priority for your child? So and what is making things hard in your life? Because I'm not living in the house with them, but I really want to get a chance to, to, to know what that reality is for a parent. And what's hard, what's hard for you right now in taking care of your child? And if you could change one thing right now, what, what, what would it be? Um, and I think that's really important. And if parents feel like they trust you enough to share that information, it's up for us to, to really listen and to pay attention and to try to see where we can take their priorities and where we can take on things that we might want to address and to help the child and see how those things can kind of come together. And I think when we do that, that's when the trust starts to build. 
And then we can start building towards working on other things as well, if needed, you know, as time goes on. But I think it's coming from a place of compassion and understanding that this is a big, it's potentially a big journey. It might be a big journey for parents, right? Journey of a journey of, of anger or denial or, or feelings of guilt or grief. And so I think it's a privilege for us to be able to, to sit with those, you know, big emotions and, and to, to journey beside the parent and the caregiver in that. And it takes time. It takes a lot of time. Yeah. yeah. And it, it might not be the first person telling a parent that their child has a challenge. It might be the third or the fifth yeah. time they hear the same challenge from different people mm -hmm. that they might be ready to, to hear it. Yeah, so. absolutely. And that, yeah, yeah, that's a really good point. And I think just trying to be gentle yes. with it, gentle, um, gentle with our words, gentle with our conversations. Yeah. But they're important conversations to have. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And actually there's another question that mm -hmm. is not along the same line, but we're talking about identifying a challenge and then next step would be diagnosis. And there are some people who are not diagnosed as children is it possible for people who are now adults to be diagnosed with disabilities like autism or like attention deficit and hyperactivity disorder, for example? Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah, I, um, when this question first came up, I had a conversation. First of all, let me back up just for a second and say, yes, it is possible. The short answer is yes it's possible to get a diagnosis as an adult and it's a personal journey and coming to it as an adult, depending on where you're coming from, and maybe you can have some initiative and you can have some, a little bit more say in, in whether or not you do pursue uh, an assessment or, or, or try to, you know, find answers to what you might be experiencing. You might, you might be able to participate more um, than if you were younger So it's a really, it's a personal journey. And I think the more information that we have, you know, then we have a lot more information now about disabilities than we did 20 years ago. So the more information that we have and the more we hear people share their experiences, the more we might be able to relate and to think, oh my goodness, okay, well maybe do I want to, is that something I want to look into? Is this impeding me from doing the things that I really want to do? And if that's the case, then maybe, maybe it would make sense to do, uh, to get some support from a professional and get, to get an assessment to see how things can be made easier. Right. So after this question came in, I had a conversation with my husband and he gave me permission to share a little bit about his story. So my husband and I decided that we wanted to support my son in having an assessment done. So my son's uh, in elementary school and we were noticing that he was having difficulties attending in class and difficulties initiating and following through on, on tasks and on uh, projects and activities and stuff. And so we felt we wanted to look in and get a psychologist to help us to, to make sure we were doing everything we could do to help him. And along that process of helping my son and going through that, both my husband and I saw things and learned more about ADHD that we saw in ourselves, you know, and it was, it, it's interesting to kind of have that experience as an adult going, Oh yeah, that that's me. And that, Oh, that's me. So for me, I could, I could relate, but it didn't, the, the challenges that I, I see or I have in my own life are not it stopping me from doing what I want to do. So I didn't decide to go and pursue an assessment right now. I didn't think it was going to be really informative and it's not what I wanted to do. So that was my choice. And I felt like I could do the tasks that I wanted to do. My husband, on the other hand, felt that there was more information that he needed. He was having a hard time, a harder time at work. He was having a harder time on the weekends. Um, and he wanted to know, okay, is there something else that I need to know? Do I, is there other things? And, and it turns out he was diagnosed with ADHD. 
And, and so for him now, he's pursuing looking, you know, he's pursuing different medications, trying to find the right dose, trying to minimize the side effects, trying to find a good balance for him, trying to put strategies and things in place that can make things easier for him. So, yeah, I mean, it, it's definitely, you know, he was at the age of 43, he came to that diagnosis. So it is, it is absolutely possible. And, you know, Sophianne, one of our colleagues, uh, Cynthia Miller Lotman, who's an occupational therapist, she has her own podcast is called swinging upside down. And one of the episodes that she has, she speaks with her husband, Michael, Michael Lotman, who, who was diagnosed with ADHD also as an adult. And Michael has been so wonderful in sharing that experience in the podcast. So we're going to invite you to listen into that because Michael is incredibly insightful and he's done a lot of work um, at looking at his ADHD and how it affects him and where does it fit into his life and what does it bring him. It brings him also some gifts too, right? And he's so very insightful on that. So if you haven't listened in yet, please listen in. We'll put those in the show notes as well. But it is a personal journey, and we are having a lot more information. And the more people share about their journeys, then the more we can better understand each other, I think. Yeah, and the example you gave, I find really interesting also. My, thanks for sharing your personal story mm -hmm. in there. And you have two different ways of going about it you found that you didn't necessarily need a diagnosis because you have already put in place a structure mm -hmm. that works for you mm -hmm. and your husband needed to know a bit more about it. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's what's important to know is that it's different from, for everyone. It's, it's good to pursue a diagnosis when you feel there's more that could be done for, to help you out in your mm -hmm. life in this. And it's, it's, easy and risky to self-diagnose because mm -hmm. when we hear when i started uh, studying occupational therapy i was hearing about different diagnoses and then i would realize that i had traits of mm -hmm. a lot of different things and again uh, i had to to stop and look at okay does it stops me in my life right now <laughs> no Maybe it's okay. Maybe I don't need to go further. And mm -hmm. if I feel eventually that it stopped me somewhere and I need more help, then I go seek. We are all on a continuum. There's no... That's right. right. It's not a red and green light, a slope, let's say, yeah. between one, one point to the other. So we can have different challenges that may look like one diagnosis that may look like autism, that may look like an attention deficit or any other diagnosis. And we are all somewhere in there. Again, yeah. if it doesn't stop us in our life, maybe maybe that's fine too. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's great. I think if you do, if you do, you know, if you're listening in and you do have concerns and you do feel like things, there's elements and pieces that you feel that you're missing and you're not able to do the things that you really want to do, then talk to your doctor at the clinic. It, it can be a long process to get a diagnosis, but in the meantime, there are supports and strategies that can be put in place without having a diagnosis. So it is a personal journey. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it is. Thank you, Sofiane. I think that was the end of our questions. Yes. I yeah. Think so. I think so too. It uh, was nice to explore them uh, again with you. Yeah. Thank you, Sofiane. It was so good to come back together again. So, just to bring you back, thank you to the listeners so much for spending your valuable time with us. So we do have quite a few podcasts now on our webpage. Um, we're very proud of them and we feel so grateful when you take your time to, to listen in. So if you go to disabilityprogramspecializedservices.org, you can find under the podcast tab, you can find our different episodes there, including our episode on general disabilities together. So thank you to the DPSS team and for everyone listening and who everyone, everyone who asked questions, we really appreciate it so much until we talk again. Thank you, Dana. Bye, Sofiane. Thanks for listening. You can stay up to date on our new blog posts by following us on Facebook or Instagram. 
just search for CHB DPSS. You can subscribe to this podcast in Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app. Just search for Disability Programs Specialized Services. If you found this episode helpful, we'd really appreciate a rating or a review as well. It's the EU is G. Let's tell these people where you live. A squash, a squash, knee in sight, then in Dan, get his scumashuyat. Mokdan, Mokdan, get his niskaman. I took the dice and Dan, just pip scushiat. You can be my legend. She